Thanks so much for having me. I think um, it should be about 20 minutes, I think. Um, I'm just going to walk you through the landscape of my work and talk about how some of the projects evolved, um, but relatively swiftly to arrive at a more detailed discussion of a work called The Opposite of Time and its companion piece, How the Artist Was Led to the Study of Nature, which has both been recently and generously acquired by Bristol Museum and Leeds Art Gallery. Uh, as Bristol Museum remains home to a great natural history display as well as the history of art, it was the perfect place for this work and hopefully this short presentation will explore some of the reasons why and how art in collaboration with other disciplines such as natural history and ornithology can help us rethink our concept of nature and therefore affect our approach to how we take care of the world around us and the role that art and museums can have in framing these propositions. Ten years ago, I was making these large outdoor works, which I termed follies. They were half sculptures that were temporary works. They were situated for a short term in various landscapes, more like events in a way, that lived on through documentation. They were about blocking out a part of the landscape to reveal something about that landscape. They created viewpoints from which the sculpture appeared round but wasn't. They were in a way a kind of critique of the way nature appeared as something over there, external to us. Um, and in a way, a kind of quiet joke about this gap between subject and object. I just wanted to take a quick, this quick tangentially show you uh, an older work from 10 years ago called Pyramid Piece and Return of the Pyramid Piece. It's tangential, but I thought interesting in terms of questions posed by museums and their role in framing ethical propositions. It was made for Tate in 2010, and it's a knitted replica a thousand times enlarged of a tiny piece of rock that I stole from the Great Pyramids of Giza when I was a boy visiting them with my dad when he was on an ornithology trip. The, not, uh, the rock, the replica of the rock is displayed next to a video of myself returning the original piece of rock back to the pyramid from which I took it 15 years previous. It's a work about guilt, what can and can't be undone. It uses personal history to talk indirectly about colonial history. It's which this has become my preferred methodology, using personal anecdotes to open up onto broader themes that can be potentially hard to talk about. Whilst making this work, I was living back in my childhood home, sharing a house with my dad. He's an ornithologist and he spent his whole life looking at, writing about and talking about birds. As a kid, I wasn't that interested in birds. I was pretty much always only interested in art. However, living together as adults, I found myself coming to my dad with a lot of questions about birds, although not birds specifically, but about things birds built nests. This was because as having spent the previous few years making sculpture, I could see these objects afresh as remarkable things, simultaneously precarious and also symbols of safety. I started to consider whether they should be thought of as natural, purely part of nature, made by instinct by birds, or whether they should be thought of as things that were made, constructed through learning and complex interactions with material, which would make them much closer to the sculptures that I made. How, does, how much does a bird know of what it is making in the moment of making a nest? In 2010, I was asked to do a talk about sculpture for the London Festival of Architecture and decided to talk about birds' nests. I did it in collaboration with my dad, with him talking about them through his expertise as an ornithologist and me considering them as a sculptural form through their material and aesthetic properties. These talks gradually scaled up through regular bookings until we were invited to present a version of it at Bristol Museum in 2015 for Bristol Green Capital. This allowed us to spend a lot of time in the basement and archives of Bristol Museum researching the extensive collection of nests from all over the world. This was interesting as the nest collections barely looked at. There's a feeling we know all we need to know um, about, oh, my notes are out of place, um, about these objects. Very little new research is ever done. Our research was unusual as it was uh, really looking at the aesthetic properties. We talked in the, um, the talk in the museum was interesting as it was the first time in a hundred years that these specimens had moved up from the store into the main museum, albeit initially just for the first evening. The talks have always been interesting to me because they're about a muddling of audiences. Some people attend because they want to learn about birds and they trust my father's reputation. Others come because it was framed as an artwork and because they're interested in sculpture or art and performance in general. 
these quite distinct audiences would sit side by side, taking slightly different things in from the discussion. Our talk titled Lecture on Nesting culminated in the discussion of the bower structure, not a nest, but an elaborate nest-like structure built for display, and the idea that art making may evolve out of such an impulse. The next challenge was to translate this project into an exhibition. It was a way, in a way it was remarkable that research in the natural history department of a museum should subsequently be commissioned for a, an exhibition in the galleries normally reserved for the presentation of art. Bristol Museum was the perfect space for this exhibition as both disciplines coexist under one roof. It allowed me to continue with the ideological aim of the talks, be able to attract two audiences at once and not compromise in terms of complexity. The, da the exhibition needed to live up to my dad's own personal manifesto to be able to bring him along on the journey, which was to teach people to look at birds as through coming, through coming to look at them closely, you begin to notice individual parts, to break down the landscape into parts, you see the interconnected but separate elements and not just see it all as simply nature. This term from passive to active looking often translates into wanting to preserve and care for the world around you. For me, I'd stopped seeing nature as something over there, but instead seeing it as something we were already always within, that we too are, and that the natural and social are not separate entities. The plan to translate the talk into the film started with these ideas, and we used green screen to deliver the talk from inside various representations of landscapes. From this film, A Natural History of Nest Building, it's all constable landscapes, including particularly these light, the late cloud studies. The film sets up a three-part relationship and unfolds in three chapters. The relationship is between nest site, nest material, and the form of a nest. As the film goes on, it performs the interweaving of these characters, of these categories, as it initially suggests a separate them as separate and shows how each depends laterally on the other. The site of a nest dictates the material it is made from, and the material dictates the form. This is a core idea of the film gradually breaking these down and then reassembling the ways we think about nature and landscape. Just show you a, a short clip. This is an example of a domed nest. This is elegantly oval and perhaps the most perfect object found in the British countryside. It's the nest of the long-tailed tit. These are normally concealed in thick prickly bushes, making them very hard to find. These nests are even more remarkable when you think that a long-tailed tit can make a nest like this in its first year, having never been shown how to do so. And it does seem hard to believe when you look at how this is made. The material used is a compact mixture of moss and gossamer, lined with feathers, and the outside embedded with hundreds of flakes of lichen. It's an almost magical object. Something I find odd is that birds' nests, as objects, don't have names. However, reading around older documents, we found that the nest of the long-tailed tit had been an exception. In the past, it had numerous old country names. In Norfolk, it had been known as the bush oven. In Northamptonshire, it was the oven's nest. In Suffolk, it was the Putney poke. In Nottingham, it was a bum barrel. In Buckingham, it was a bottle tom. And elsewhere, it's been referred to as a feather poke, pudding bag, hedge jug, jack in a bottle, long pod, and poke bag. The long-tailed tit's nest earned it the reputation as the master builder of the English countryside, and its delicate dome is perhaps only rivaled by one of the most marvellous of all nests, those made by the weaver birds of Africa and India. In Africa alone, there are 78 different species of weaver, and each of these lives up to its name. These alluring objects feel strange and alien, but at the same time closely connected to our human world. They're made by tearing grass or rattan into strips, then weaving these over and under much in the same way as we would turn thread into fabric. Yet these are so precise that it's difficult to imagine it being assembled by a bird using just its beak and feet. Many historical African texts and subsequent anthropological research suggest that the first African woven baskets and textiles were directly influenced by watching weaver birds at work. The film was positioned in the gallery as first glimpse through a very large scale replica of a bower which I built from a willow. The bower becomes a central motif of the show, a natural object that points to the creative spirit of play in nature and the evolutionary development of the impulse to make art and how this intersects with our concept of nature. 
there seems to be a point in which the externalization of expression through a synthesis of judgment in the bird's design of the bower and the objects it chooses to surround the bower with can be located in nature. The impulse, although here explainable in terms of sexual selection, but that points towards how our own need for expression and how the concept of art as something external to us might have evolved. The exhibition also brings nests up into the gallery, both my personal collection and the museum's collection in the case of Bristol, creating an exhibit that is positioned as a collaboration between art and natural history, allowing the sculptural properties of the nest to be fully appreciated. The nests are shown near my wood turnings, um, or, which are based on the songs of birds and setting up a uh, discourse between um, conservation, craft and material. The wood turnings are called Silent Spring after Rachel Carson's book that helped usher in the ecological age by identifying the lack of bird song was due to new pesticides sprayed on the fields. These wood turnings are monuments to songs based on the sound waves of birds, a record of the song in case that song were ever to be lost. So these, those works form the natural history part of the show. In Bristol Museum, as with when the other venues that the show toured to, um, in a separate space, there was a second section of the show which positioned itself as a kind of counterpoint, a social history. This is um, a narrative told by an animated crow of the history of egg collecting in Britain. I'll show you this work through a few selected um, clips from the 30 minute film. Egg collecting began with further, or certainly methodical documentation, in the early 19th century. It was part of the almost always aristocratic amateur scientist drive to classify, name, and understand the natural world. Expeditions were undertaken to bring back specimens, primarily the skins of birds, for taxidermy, display, but most importantly, for classification. And with this drive to understand the natural world, the collection of eggs began in earnest. The noble pursuit of the gentleman scientist is exemplified in the journals of John Woolley. The crow flies through a history of landscape painting. So we start where we left off in the previous work with Constable and a very particular depiction of nature. I'll show you a jump forward a little bit in time. As the pursuit of the amateur scientist gathered pace and collections were amassed, egg collecting, egg collecting evolved, evolved into its own discipline. Oology. The late 19th and early 20th centuries were the halcyon days for egg collectors. There was an emphasis on collecting data, recording observations. These resulted in vast private hoards such as that amassed by Lord Rothschild, and gradually many of these collections ended up being donated to public museums. Rothschild's collection is a significant quantity of those now housed at the Natural History Museum in London. The collection of Stanley Lewis, gathered around the southeast of England and then trips further afield, collected from 1890 until his death in 1949, now forms the backbone of the collection of Bristol Museum. Lewis wrote The Breeding Birds of Somerset and Their Eggs as a depository for all his knowledge gained through his zoological pursuits. I included this clip as a direct reference to the research undertaken in Bristol Museum. We began to see uh, the, also the contradiction emerge here. Egg collecting's origins as a way of understanding the natural world was an important part of how our knowledge of the countryside developed. It was through collecting eggs that we got an insight into breeding and the formative insights of ecology. However, the scale of egg collecting at this point starts to impact the object of study. And in this case, like the bird, like the bird redback shrike or the osprey threatens the, in fact, the survival of the species. The 1920s and 1930s saw egg collecting grow exponentially. It acquired the status of a more general pastime, trickling down into the popular imagination, and it became a fairly common hobby for anyone interested in the countryside and the birds that inhabit it. Amongst those who lived in the countryside, it was often actively encouraged. Travel increased and egg collectors dispersed widely in search of rare species and unusual clutches. I, um, through the film and narrative uh, of how egg collecting evolves, here we reach a point in the 1940s, it becomes a common pastime hobby, actively encouraged as a way for children to engage with and understand the world around them. 
you'll start to notice that the film unfolds, the landscape paintings evolve too in chronological order. It's a history of British landscape painting through details and crops. The paintings allow you to know where you are in time and increasingly through the way the painting surfaces change, we feel a move from realism and romanticism to increasingly abstract depiction of landscape. Egg collecting was made illegal in 1954, which changed the nature of our relationship to the natural world. However, in 1954, it was made illegal to take a wild bird's egg. The criminalization of this formerly scholarly activity turned common pastime, which altered the relationship with the natural world considerably. The law, although aimed at serious collectors and preserving rare species, also incriminated the numerous enthusiasts who'd grown up being actively encouraged to go out and collect and study eggs. The books on eggs and nests came to an end, the RSPB ensuring that the law was upheld and that egg collecting was sufficiently policed. So egg collecting was made illegal in 1954 and legal changes and social codes have a huge impact on our relationship to nature. So egg collecting, which started as a hobby encouraged for children, was within 20 years turned into an illegal activity. But many people continued to collect illegally, as we'll see in this last section of the film, which chronicles many of the police raids of hidden collections. One treasury of eggs that was unearthed in an investigation was on a truly exceptional scale. 7,707 eggs were discovered in a concealed room of the home of Richard Pearson. Pearson was a painter and decorator from Cleethorpes, Lincolnshire, who spent every evening and weekend painfully researching the locations of nest sites. His collection contained the eggs of the very rarest breeding birds, including Golden Eagle, Little Tern, Osprey, Black Neck Grebe, Avocet, Black Tailed Godwit, Stone Curly, Chuff, Peregrine Falcon, and Red back shrine. This collection was the one I chose to recreate for the exhibition. Why recreate it? Because the original collection was destroyed because it had been collected illegally and despite its, despite its scientific value. For it to have entered a museum would have validated the act illegal activity of collecting. I chose to make the eggs in porcelain with the help of an ex-gamekeeper and taxidermist that I got to know through my father. The eggs are deeply pleasurable to look at, and they both remind us of the spectacular aesthetic qualities of the eggs as a perfect form, whilst the image simultaneously makes the stomach turn at all the birds that were not able to be because due to the eggs being stolen from the nests. The collection was hidden in a house that no one could see it, complicates it further, and turning this image into a sculpture, I hope recreates an object that can forever reanimate these feelings and the questions it raises. The film continues to talk about the complications that come with outlawing egg collecting. The egg collections from 1960s required, were, re, were required to prove the effects of DDT and illegal collections were needed for scientific research. In the 1960s, egg collections were pivotal in one of the most important discoveries in environmental science, the devastating effects of pesticides on the countryside. The naturalist Derek Ratcliffe pinpointed the cause in the catastrophic decline in birds of prey by comparing eggs from historic collections with those collected in the 1960s and found that old eggshells were heavier and the walls of newer eggs were considerably thinner. So this, this in a way is a small tale of one corner of the British landscape, I think, and it becomes a way of helping us understand the complexities and contradictions of how we regulate, conserve, protect, police and manage the landscape around us which we are a part of and forever entangled with. How can we understand landscape when we're always or already within it? The natural world and the social history are part of the same landscape and always intertwined with us as part of them. We are not separate but always within. I think that art is one way to help us understand this. The work I hope proposes a collaboration between science and art as well as father and son through spending time Learning to see the world through another set of criteria helps you become aware that these criteria or apparatuses for understanding are arbitrary in some way, subject to change through the unfolding ideas presented by society, which we inherit. The way we see the world is a mixture of the innate and the learned, and the learned is based on environmental factors. 
As our ideology changes, so does the way we approach and apprehend an object. When I look at a nest, there are many ways I can ask questions of it or try to understand it. But beyond that, the nest remains what it is, a perfect mixture of landscape, a synthesis of materials, location and form. As we see in the perfect ascetic object of the bird's egg, categories we use to make sense of the world are not easy to separate. And when, work, and when working with them together, it can help us see the landscape around us in a new way and to evaluate the categories we use to understand the world we are within.